you've probably noticed that oil and water don't mix together, right? This um, looks like maybe olive oil and water. You make, you know, oil and vinegar or salad dressing or Italian dressing and, and then a cute little cruet with the top and you shake it up and, and mix it up. But as soon as you set it down, it starts separating, right? And the oil goes to the top and the water goes to the bottom. It doesn't matter how many times you shake it up, it keeps doing that. Why do things do that? Some things don't mix, other things do mix. There's something about the water molecules that makes them bunch together, and they're basically excluding the oil molecules. They're pushing them out. And understanding shapes of molecules is going to help us to understand why oil and water will not mix. If we look at a water molecule, here's a Lewis structure for water, we see that um, Oxygen, let's do it this way. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted something else. So oxygen, how many valence ox electrons does oxygen have? Six. Six. So if those are the valence electrons for oxygen, and maybe we'll give hydrogen a blue color. And so there's, each hydrogen has one valence electron, right? So when these bonds form, the hydrogen is sharing one electron with the oxygen, and the oxygen is sharing one electron with the hydrogen, and the same thing's going on over here. They're sharing, but atoms don't always share their electrons equally, right? Just like children don't always share things equally. So you've got the 11-year-old brother and the 5-year-old brother, and you know, the 11-year-old's trying to pull one over on the little guy, and he cuts up whatever they're sharing. Um, he cuts it up, and he's trying to trick the little brother and give him the smaller half, right? Maybe it's a, a big cookie or something. He broke it in half, and he's trying to give the little brother the small half, right? Are they sharing? Yeah, they're sharing, but they're not sharing equally. Sharing equally is when each side gets exactly the same. And that's kind of hard in real life, and, and it's a little bit hard with atoms as well. In this relationship here between hydrogen and oxygen, oxygen is going to hog this pair of electrons. They're not going to be shared equally. Oxygen, we say, is more electronegative. Electronegativity can be defined as the ability of an element to attract electrons within a covalent bond. Electronegativity is um, an idea, and it just has a relative scale. And so what they did is they said, well, fluorine is the most electronegative element. We're going to give it an electronegativity of 4.0, I guess kind of like a grade point average or something and something with no electronegativity, no attractiveness for electrons would be a zero. And so we can look at the relative electronegativity of different elements and predict how they're going to share electrons. With oxygen and hydrogen, they don't share that pair of electrons equally. And so if we were to do a multiple exposure of where those electrons are, we'd see that there's more electron density over here around the oxygen than there is around the hydrogen. So this brings me to another Mrs. K's chemistry land crazy example. So these are oxygen and hydrogen are two houses in a neighborhood. These people live next door to each other. And they each have a little boy, and the little boys like to play together. They're just best buddies, right? And so oxygen's little guy and hydrogen's little guy, their little electrons go out to play. Well, they're, they're going to spend more time around oxygen's house because oxygen's place is more fun. It's more attractive to little boys. Oxygen is more electronegative. It has a stronger ability to attract electrons. Why is this a cooler place? Well, they've got an in-ground swimming pool with a diving board and a slide. And they've got Xbox and Wii and a big giant screen TV. 
with all the channels that are possible, and their Wi-Fi is really fast. And if you even mention that you might be hungry, their mom will actually order pizza to be delivered. And they've got a soda fountain in the kitchen. I mean, doesn't that sound like a fun place for little boys to hang out, right? And over here at Hydrogen's house, they've got an old black and white television. And it doesn't even get broadcast TV anymore because it's not digital, right? I don't think they even make digital TVs that are black and white. Do you know that they used to make black and white televisions? Yeah, OK. <laughs> I, I'm just you know, kind of having an age check here. Um, so all they have is an old um, VHS player, right? And so you can watch like Barney and stuff on videotape. And if you're hungry, mom will give you um, a couple pieces of white bread and a glass of water. They don't even have an ice maker. And in the backyard, they've got, um, they've got some grass. Um, and dad's real picky about the grass. So it's not like my backyard where half of it is theoretically garden, but you know, the kids are allowed to dig these ginormous holes. Right, because I don't know why my children love to dig holes. They won't do chores, but they'll go out there and dig for hours. But this place, you can't even dig in the dirt because Dad's got this beautiful lawn out there, and he doesn't want you to touch it. So those little boys. This is a more attractive place. And so the electrons spend more time over here than they do over there. Now, hydrogen's electron does go home occasionally to brush his teeth or change his clothes or something. It's not like he moved in with the oxygen family. That would be an ionic bond where electrons are transferred from one to another, right? It's like, oh, well, we're going to adopt you. And hydrogen's family says, bye, see ya. That's not what's going on here. He still lives here, but he just spends most of his time over here. So this is what we call a polar bond. Because when the electrons are not shared equally, the electrons have charge. This causes a charge imbalance in this uh, bond. And so there's a partial negative. This little guy here, it kind of looks like um, a lowercase d with a bad back or something. He's slumping badly. That's a lowercase Greek delta. And we use that to indicate a partial charge. This isn't a minus 1 charge. It's like maybe 0.5 or 0.3 or something. It's a partial charge. Partial negative charge here, partial positive charge over there. And so we call this a dipole moment. It's a separation of charges within the bond. When you have covalent bonds with dipole moments, we call them polar covalent bonds. When you hear the word polar, what do you think of? Cold. Opposites. Magnets. Magnets have poles, right? The poles of a magnet are different from each other, right? And the poles of the planet, which is where it's cold, are different. There's a magnetic north and south pole of our planet, even though it's a it's a sphere, but one end is different than the other. And we're using the word polar in that connotation here, that one end of the bond is different from the other end. The greater the difference in electronegativity between those elements, the greater the dipole moment. So the situation I described for those two little boys, that's a pretty big difference between those two houses, right? That's going to be a large dipole moment that's going to be a very polar bond. What if they were the same except, you know, one family's Wi-Fi was on the fritz? Well, you know, kind of then depends on what the kids want to do, but it's going to be shared. They'll spend more time equally, but a little bit to the side that the Wi-Fi is actually working, right? So big difference in electronegativity, big difference in polarity. Large polarity. <clears throat> Electronegativity follows a trend in the periodic table. So here they're representing a more electronegative element as being um, a taller block. And we've left out the transition metals. Oops. We've left out the transition metals because they're squirrely and un kind of unpredictable. So we're just looking at the main group elements. <clears throat> 
what we see is that as you go across a period and up a group, electronegativity increases. We need to remember this trend. And the way I remember it is I just remember that fluorine is the most electronegative. Fluorine is the coolest place for little boys to hang out. I mean, it's just awesome. And so the closer you are to fluorine, the more electronegative you are. So if you're looking at, say, astatine and bromine to con compare electronegativities, just ask, well, who's closer to fluorine? Bromine's closer. He's going to be more electronegative. Now, there are some that have the same electronegativity. Um, so nitrogen is a 3.0 and chlorine is a 3.0. And chlorine is closer to fluorine and yet they're the same. Right? So there are some situations like that. We're not going to worry about it too much. Then do you see hydrogen over here being an exception again? He's sticking way up above these guys over here. But hydrogen, in terms of, we usually see him interacting with these nonmetals over here. He has a relatively low electronegativity compared to these guys. So if the two elements in the covalent bond have the same electronegativity, then the electrons are going to be shared equally and there's no dipole moment. So in this example, we have two chlorine atoms. These are the same element. Their electronegativities have to be the same, right? They are exactly the same. And so the electrons will be shared equally, and there's no partial positive or partial negative charge because they're, they're spending equal time around each atom. Not, and so we call this a nonpolar bond because it's not polar. So anytime you see two atoms of the same element, nonpolar. If there's a really large difference, it actually becomes an ionic bond because that electron is just completely transferred. That little guy says, you know, this, this family is so much more awesome than this family I was born into. I want them to adopt me. And he just, he's literally adopted by that other family, and if they move to Texas, he goes to Texas with them. I'm not, you know, passing any value judgments on any of that, but this is help you remember. So in this situation, chlorine was just so much more electronegative than sodium that sodium just gave that electron to chlorine, and chlorine took it. And now that electron belongs to this chlorine. It's now a chloride ion. But if these guys separate, that chloride is going to go off with that electron. So ionic bonds are when you have a very large difference in electronegativity. And what we need to remember for this class is a metal and a nonmetal. If we go back to this table, we see that the nonmetals, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, all of these guys are relatively high in electronegativity, and the metals are much lower. And so the difference here is enough for it to be an ionic bond. If there's kind of an in-the-middle electronegativity difference, we say this is a polar covalent bond. And these are common between two nonmetals. So for hydrogen and fluorine, hydrogen is less electronegative its end of the bond is going to have a little bit of a positive charge and fluorine's going to be a little bit negative because fluorine's the most electronegative. That's the coolest place for electrons to hang out. It is a continuous scale. So if we look at electronegativity difference, um, the smallest difference we can have, of course, is zero if you have two identical elements, um, up to a difference of 3.3. And so we've kind of arbitrarily defined um, a nonpolar bond as having a difference between 0 and 0.4. A polar covalent bond falls with a difference of 0.4 to 2.0, and 2.0 to 3.3 is considered an ionic bond. So I want to put that out there, but then I'm going to tell you what I want you to know. I would like you to be able to look at a bond and predict whether it is pure covalent, meaning nonpolar, polar covalent, or ionic. And these are the, the guidelines I'm going to give you. So ionic bond, 
Ooh, that's way too fat. Metal, non-metal. Lost the end in there. So if you're looking at a bond and one element's a metal and one's a non-metal, I'd like you to say that's an ionic bond. A, oh, good grief. Pure covalent or... Nonpolar covalent. Um, let's say it this way the same element. So a carbon carbon bond, a nitrogen nitrogen bond. It's the same element. The electronegativity difference is zero. That's nonpolar. And if you have two different Nonmetals. Two different nonmetals. We're going to just kind of generalize and say that's a polar bond. This is not going to work for all situations, but it's going to work most of the time, and it requires less memorizing and less looking at charts. Okay, because we're never going to memorize electronegativities. That's just dumb. And I don't even think memorizing these categories is a good idea. There could be a question of mastering chemistry that asks you to do something like that. But I wouldn't do that on an exam. But we do need to know this sort of information, especially if you need to go on and take any other chemistry classes. It's really important to be able to predict whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar. Any questions? So here's an example of something you need to be able to do. Determine whether the bond perf performed. Whether the bond formed between each pair of atoms is a pure covalent, meaning nonpolar, polar covalent, or ionic. So between iodide, I, sorry, iodine and iodine, what kind of a bond is that going to be? Pure covalent or nonpolar. Nonpolar covalent. How about cesium and bromine? It's going to be ionic because cesium is a metal. Phosphorus and oxygen. That'll be polar covalent. They're both nonmetals, but they're different. Okay? So that's all you need to know. So that's identifying the polarity of bonds. But just because you have polar bonds doesn't mean that the whole molecule is polar. When we talk about a polar molecule, we mean that the entire molecule has a, di a net dipole moment. It's going to have polar bonds, but those polar bonds are going to add together instead of canceling each other out. If you have a diatomic molecule, diatomic meaning two atoms, with a polar bond, then the molecule is going to be polar. There's only one bond. There's nothing that can cancel out. But if you have um, more than two atoms, um, you can have polar bonds canceling each other out. And we're going to look at that. So let's look at carbon dioxide. We already looked at its Lewis structure and its geometry and we decided that it was linear. Right. If we look at this carbon-oxygen bond, we predict that that's a polar bond because these are two nonmetals and they're not the same. Carbon and oxygen are different. Which is more electronegative, carbon or oxygen? Which one's closer to fluorine? Oxygen's more electronegative. And so if we're using the little delta symbols, Then we would say oh, this is a partial negative and this is a partial positive. Because we're talking about the electrons and the electrons are more attracted to the oxygen. This arrow is a different notation and the arrow points to the house that's more attractive. So it's like 
you know, somebody came looking for little Johnny, and, and the neighbor was outside, and they said, hey, where did Johnny go? And they point at the fun house, right? Oh, they're over there. So this is the neighbor pointing at the more electronegative house, and then we put a little plus sign on the other end to help us to remember that this end is positive and that end is negative. If we look at the other carbon-oxygen bond, we have exactly the opposite situation happening. It's happening in the other direction. Here's the oxygen, and the, the electrons between this carbon and oxygen are spending more time at this oxygen, making this end partially negative and that end partially positive again. In effect, these two polar bonds cancel each other out. If you remember vector addition from your math background, that's what we're doing here. We're adding vectors. And so we have a vector going this way and a vector going that way. Their magnitudes are equal. They cancel out. Adds up to zero. You could also think of playing tug of war. So here you've got a guy in the middle, and then you've got one person over here and one person over here, and they're pulling in opposite directions with equal strength. Are these people going to move? They're just going to stand there and pull on each other, right? Until this guy's arms get so sore, he says, uncle, and makes him stop. If the, if the one over here was much stronger than the other two, then the whole group of them would move this way, because that guy would be winning, right? He'd be pulling both of those guys, the guy standing in the middle and the guy pulling on the other side. But if the guy on this end and that end are equally strong, then the rope's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to stay there. Does that make any sense? And so the, the pulling of electrons this way and the pulling of electrons this way ends up in a molecule that does not have a positive and a negative end. And so the molecule is nonpolar. So. We can represent those bonds with arrows or vectors. And if those are pointing in opposite directions, those dipole moments cancel out. If we have something like water, water has a bent structure. Each of these bonds is a polar bond. Hydrogen is less electronegative. Oxygen is more electronegative. And so we can represent that dipole moment of the bond as a vector pointing this way, an arrow and there's an arrow pointing this way. And if we take these two vectors and add them together, we end up with one that goes straight up the middle. And so oxygen has a partial negative charge, and this end of the molecule has a partial positive charge. One end of the water molecule is a little bit negative, and the other's a little bit positive. And that's because water has a bent shape. If it was linear, that wouldn't happen. It'd be like carbon dioxide, and it would be nonpolar. But water is polar, and that has huge ramifications for all kinds of things. Um, so here's some pictures from the textbook that show um, adding the vectors together. And you can read that. I mean, yeah, okay. So, according to what your book is saying, this is what we need to do. We need to determine um, whether the molecule has polar bonds. And we're going to say that if the two bonding atoms have different electronegativities, the bond's going to be polar. And then we have to decide do they add together. And we need to consider the geometry of the molecule. And is it symmetrical? And so, you know, that's the, the maybe the high level of understanding all of this. And I'm going to tell you my, my tricks. So Mrs. K's alternate method for determining molecular polarity. And again, this doesn't work all the time, but it works most of the time. And most of the time is pretty good. So we need to look at the Lewis structure. Still need to look at the Lewis structure. And we say it's nonpolar if both of these things are true. One, no lone pairs on the central atom. And two, 
the atoms that are bonded to the central atom all have the same, are the same or have the same electronegativities. So let's do an example. Determine whether methane is polar, CH4. We need to look at the Lewis structure. So the Lewis structure is going to be C, H, 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 H. So let, let's do my method first. Look at the central atom. Are there any lone pairs? No. Are all of the atoms bonded to the central atom the same as each other? Yes, these are all hydrogens. So both condition one and two are met, and so I predict this is a nonpolar molecule. That's how you use my rules of thumb. The other way is we see, okay, well, there's four groups around this, so that makes this a tetrahedral molecule. So it's going to have this shape here. And which would you predict to be more electronegative, carbon or hydrogen? Which is closer to fluorine on the periodic table? Carbon. So then the vectors are going like this. I want to do that. You know, I'm going to do that in a different color because otherwise we can't see what I'm doing. Those vectors are equally spaced. They're all pointing at the same thing, and they're all equal lengths. Can you kind of, kind of get an idea that those would like cancel each other out? They would. And so, that predicts that this is nonpolar. So, which method do you like better? You like mine better? I like mine better. It works. Let's do another one. Let's look at NH3. We need the Lewis structure first. So nitrogen is going to be in the middle. It's going to be bonded to those hydrogens. And then if we count up electrons, we realize that uh, nitrogen must have a lone pair on it because there's five electrons from nitrogen and three from the hydrogens gives us eight, and there we've got eight. So now we're going to look at the central atom. Is there a lone pair on the central atom? Yes. yes. Okay. Polar. Done. I didn't mean to shout with my marker there, but I guess I did. Um, what happens is that lone pair makes the molecule lopsided. So if there's a lone pair on the central atom, it's almost always going to be a polar molecule. Let's look at SO2. I don't really feel like looking at SO2, but we're going to because it's here. Sometimes it's tempting to just draw the three atoms and say, oh, well, it must be linear, la di da di da yeah, but what if there's lone pairs? So we have, to, we have to think about this. So each of these is in group 6A. So we've got a total of 18 electrons here, 6, 6, and 6. So I've got 2, 4 from the uh, bonds, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So that's not going to work. So I'm going to have to take a lone pair from the sulfur and move them over here to make a bond between the sulfur and the oxygen. And now I see that everybody's got eight electrons. Now I can look at my central atom and ask myself, does it have a lone pair? Yes. Therefore, it is polar. That's a polar molecule. Now, it doesn't look like a polar molecule the way I've drawn it, but it has three groups around it. And so if you draw the picture, Here's your lone pair, 
and here's your double bond, and here's your single bond. And the lone pair doesn't come into this because it's not a bond, it's just a lone pair of electrons hanging out of there. Sulfur and oxygen, oxygens should be more electronegative, and so the vectors are going out this way. Are those going to add up to zero? Are they going to cancel each other out? No, they're not. And so this is going to be a polar molecule. Okay, we need one more example because I, I didn't put an example in like this. What about something like, ooh, I don't want that. CH3Cl. It's going to look like this. There's the Lewis structure for that one. Polar or nonpolar? Are there lone pairs on the central atom? No. Are all these atoms the same? We've got three hydrogens, and that one's different, right? Chlorine is different. Chlorine and hydrogen are different elements. They're probably going to have different electronegativities. So because this guy's different, this is not a round, nice, symmetrical, all the polar dipole things canceling each other out. It's going to be lopsided. And so this is a polar molecule. How do I shout it again? Any questions? Draw the Lewis structure. Look at the central atom. To be nonpolar, it has to have no lone pairs. And all the atoms that are bonded to that central atom have to be the same or have the same electronegativity. So now we can explain why oil and water will not mix with each other. Water molecules are polar. We just talked about that. And so they are like little bar magnets with north and south poles. So we've got the oxygen end being a little negative and the hydrogen end being positive. And this oxygen end is negative. Opposites attract. And so the oxygen of one water molecule is attracted, I'm sorry, the hydrogen of one is attracted to the oxygen of the other. And this causes the molecules to interact with each other very strongly. They, they really like each other. And they are so strongly attracted to each other that they exclude the oil. I like this picture. This is a picture of marbles, but the solid colored marbles are magnetic, and the multicolored ones are just regular glass marbles. Magnetic marbles are going to stick together, just like those water molecules do. They're attracted to each other. They stick together. They're like a close group of friends. And then here's the glass marbles. They are not able to interact magnetically with these marbles because these don't have any magnetic properties. And so if you take these marbles and you jumble them all up together, what's going to happen? All the magnetic marbles are going to stick together and the glass marbles are going to be on the outside. That's the same thing that happens with oil and water because oil molecules are nonpolar. They don't have a positive and a negative end, and so there's very little attraction between the oil molecules. And it's certainly not the same kind of attraction that's between the water molecules. So all the water molecules are like these magnetic marbles, and they are sticking together, and they are excluding the oil. You can shake them up, mix them up, and then they'll go back to that right away. Now, have you ever had, um, they call it creamy Italian salad dressing, right? You can, get, you can get salad dressing that doesn't separate out. How do they do that? Well, they use an emulsifying agent. They use it, something that's going to enable these two types of molecules to interact with each other. And that's what soap does as well. If you've ever done any baking and had to grease 
um, a cake pan with Crisco, you know that it's hard to get the Crisco off your hand, right? Running it under water isn't going to do anything. You're going to need some soap, right? Why does soap get rid of grease and oil when water doesn't? Well, this is an illustration of a soap molecule. So soap molecules have this long, nonpolar tail that's very oil-like, and at one end they have a polar head, which is water-like. So this polar head is attracted to the water. The nonpolar tail is attracted to the grease or the oil. And so what you end up with is you've got uh, wrong thing. You get all these little water-loving heads sticking out in the water, and the grease-loving tails, it's like uh, settlers circling their wagons, right, to defend themselves. So this, this forms what's called a micelle. And in here is a nonpolar environment where the little globs of grease or oil are very comfortable interacting with the nonpolar tails of the soap. But then on the outside, it has polar heads, which are attracted to the water. And so we get these little tiny micelles that can distribute throughout the water. And that allows the water to wash them away instead of them all sticking together on your hand. And there we have the end of chapter 10.